This video is not meant for children and is brought to you by support from Patreon. Hello, hello, and welcome, everyone. I am Maester Alix, and this is a Saturday update. And this one's going to be a little bit different from the others. Uh, first off, uh, let me go do with the channel news first. I finished my Hard Space Shipbreaker series, and I'm very excited. I really love that game, not only for the gameplay, but for the story. And I shared the story on the channel, so please enjoy that. The uh, last one's a bit long, but it has all the ending movies and stuff, so that's really good. Otherwise, things are progressing really well. We have uh, Mech Warrior, Battletech, and Car Mechanic Simulator coming up this week. And for those of you who don't know or are new to the channel, A, hi, and B, I am a role player. I like to indulge in my creative thinking skills and have had this story in my head for a long time. So here's the end of the regular update coming up as a bit of reading of a setting and an idea I've had. So buckle up. I think you're going to enjoy it. Setting. Somewhat distant future on far off locations. Asteroid, non-Earth planets, etc. Space travel is still very dangerous and expensive. Robots are great, but they are not perfect, especially when they are meant to mine things up or explore the surface of an airless rock and not do combat. I mean, they can. Kinda. Sorta. Not really. So what is the solution? Send a rocket with genetic goo to a mining site and clone a person at the location. Have the robots fine-tune the genes for the specific environment, so we can have the Venus clones look at the asteroid clones and go, Good God, what's that? Or even a baseline human. These clones will be soldiers, sentinels, and defenders of the dig sites or mining rovers or whatever needs protection from rival mining groups, corporate interests, etc. The clones come with some cybernetic implants in their brains that not only allow for specific machine interface, but also a level of stack recording, like altered carbon. I... Don't think it'll be that perfect, though. The implant's main purpose is to interface with their combat environmental suits, swap the mining laser for a combat one, and your gold. These things are like exo-frames from Exosquad, but a little bit more plug-and-play. For example, if a trooper comes across an older battlefield in a crater and finds a working grenade launcher, they could, somewhat, easily remove it from the downed clone suit and rather easily attach it to their own. You awaken in the biotank as the slatted floor presses up against your back and lifts you out of the goo. Your brand new body is free of aches and pains, but there is a sensation of the new eyes and skin as light and air attack the fresh parts. A flash of memory crosses over you as a plug is set into your implant, and your mind is filled with the memories of your iteration before. Not perfect, but enough for you to sit up and grab your chest as the memory of the former iteration's chest wound flows painfully in. After about ten minutes, the newness has worn off, the memories have settled, and the last of the valuable goo has dripped off your body. You climb off the table and start to prepare. Whatever killed you is still out there. You cross the room, and as you do, you notice the door at the medical bay is open, the light's on. You creep over and look inside. There, dead on a chair, is your former self, sucking chest wound visible and even the damaged lung. Sadly, de the device next to your old body had stopped printing a new lung and simply read DECEASED across its panel. With your new body made, a few robots have started to reclaim your old biomass for recycling. You head over to the place you know and remember your gear to be. The galley's food packets have some missing. You take one more for yourself. You head to the clothing bay, and there is a bloody set on the floor, three other sets missing. You grab a fresh set and dress yourself for the first time, again. You don't know or remember what happened to the other three sets, but the bloody ones was thanks to your former iteration. Now you are fed, dressed, and ready to work, barely 30 minutes after your death. You flex your feet inside your boots and then head out to the armor bay. There, like the clothes, three are missing and one is damaged. However, the damaged one does seem to have a few upgrades. So you grab the universal tool and swap the upgrades. An advanced HUD is slotted into the upgrade port in the helmet, and the standard laser on the suit was replaced with a combat laser. At least one thing had gone well. 
And with the old suit being damaged, salvaging a secondary battery capacitor from it will help with the power issue that contributed to your death. Opening doors to the exterior, you see the great, huge vastness of space stretched above you, and ahead of you a long expanse of regolith gray of the moon's surface. A crater was off to the right and a large mountain-like structure off to the left. You know the mountain to be some kind of asteroid that crashed here and was to be mined. A small swarm of robots have left many marks on the ground. The lack of atmosphere and weather means those tracks will be here for a long, long time. Many of the tracks you made coming back are still here and still hold the red splotches of the blood that fell. You take a breath and head out. The crunch of the regolith is heard through the armor and boots. After a few steps, it's easy to ignore. Your HUD lights up, and there's a beacon of some sort in the crater. Looking that way, the herd of large machines in that direction looking like grazing beasts. You turn that way and walk. You've got a job to do. The pilot surveyed the former battlefield. The asteroid they stood on was almost tidal locked, so the light coming from overhead would remain so for another 400 hours. The pilot came to the crater in ground, and where an advanced combat frame and its pilot had landed hard, and now set up against the edge of the crater. She looked it over, and then shook herself. The dead pilot inside was herself. She would walk carefully over to it. The microgravity of the asteroid was there, but didn't help much. She would flick her arm out, and then would carefully start to remove bits from the armor. Missile pods. I hope I knew how to use them, she said, and detached them easily enough. Soon she popped open the seal on the other armor and saw her own face start to freeze over from the exposure to space. Bubbles of breath fell from her former lips. She then reached back to the other skull, and with the tool she pulled free of the connections and a few intel chips. She'd install those later, along with the missile pod. Let's see what else I did. <laughs>